So today I'm going to show you an underfreezing system that claims to have great output at super low flow temperature heating and could be a perfect solution to poorly insulated properties that want to run on a heat pump. As a matter of fact, this seems to be a perfect system if it wasn't for some minor details, but we will get to those later. So on this project we are fitting an air source heat pump, Valent Aerotherm 7 kilowatt unit to an end of terrace three bedroom property that was built in 1965. And although it's a relatively modern build, it doesn't have cavity walls. Those walls are solid brick, three bricks deep, which I do find highly unusual. It also has large windows on the front and the back. So relatively large heat loss for 130 square meters property of eight kilowatts. Now, if you're wondering why am I fitting seven kilowatt heat pump to an eight kilowatt heat loss property, uh, it's because uh, the naming or badging of the units is very confusing. So Valent, for example, uh, marks the unit, the batched out of this at minus seven. At minus two, we're gonna get around 8.5 kilowatts out of this heat pump. And the output also depends on the flow temperature we're gonna run the system at. And what are we doing here? We are installing under for heating to the ground floor. So that was prepared by the builders for us. So you see, they put insulation on the floor and they put OSB deck 30 millimeters below. And we are using a very interesting under for heating system from a company called Jupiter. What's unusual about this system is the fact that this system, so the buildup of the system is 0.5 millimeters aluminum plates and some kind of a fiber material. And this system seems to have, uh, if we are to believe manufacturers data, really high output for a given flow temperature. To give you an idea, the heat loss per square meter of the ground floor on average is around 70 watts. Meeting 70 watts uh, with underfloor heating with timber floor finishes is kind of tricky. When it comes to underfloor heating, you have to remember uh, there's a lot of variables that come into play when you calculate underfloor heating output. So, the higher the flow temperature, the higher the output. However, you are limited by the surface temperature that should never go above 29 degrees Celsius. Then we've got pipe spacing. So the narrower the pipe spacing, the higher the output. And 99% of overlay systems on the market out there, the systems that you can install on timber floors, uh, have the uh, minimum 150 millimeters spacing. So you are limited by that spacing. Then there is the material we're gonna use on top as well. So we've got something called TOG values uh, when it comes to flooring. So TOG values are, they stand for uh, thermal overall grade. And the higher that grade, the higher the TOG value, the more insulating the material is. So for example, tiles or stone are close to zero, so they don't put any resistance on a heat transfer, so they're perfect for underfloor heating. However, if you want timber flooring or carpets, they can be one or 1.5 TOG value and you usually need around five degrees hotter flow temperature per every one TOG value you go up. And by the way, TOG value is the same thing as uh, surface resistance or resistance to heat transfer or R value. Uh, it's just a different number. R value uh, is one tenth of a TOG value. So our issue here is when I was originally quoting for this job was, well, I don't know of an underflow heating that can meet heat demand of this property if we put timber on top of it and if it's non-screeded system. So the client have found this Jupiter system and what's different about this Jupiter system is the fact that it has a narrow pipe spacing. This is 125 millimeters, uh, so slightly narrower than most systems on the market. It has much thicker aluminum plates that can transfer the heat much better. It also encapsulates the pipe in the groove much better than other systems because it has kind of a, an omega shape or reverse omega shape. So we have to push the pipe quite hard to get it in, I would imagine. I don't know, I haven't done the pipe work yet. So if you were to compare this system to uh, very popular XPS panels or foil back panels with 150 mil spacing for 16 mil pipe work, for this property to get 70 watts output per square meter in this room, I would have to run a heat pump at 55 degrees flow if we're talking about uh, timber floor finishes over the underfloor heating. This system from Jupiter 
if the data is correct and if I've read it correctly, promises me 70 watts per square meter output at 43 degrees Celsius. That is 12 degrees lower than XPS panels. On a heat pump, it's a difference between running a seasonal efficiency of 300% or 400%. Obviously, we have to install it and run the system and see what happens. Now, let me show you other stuff we've done on this job so far. Because this property used to have a combi boiler that was right here in the kitchen on the wall. We had to find space for a cylinder and the only space we could find was the existing airing cupboard on the first floor. That means that we have to run new primary pipe work, which is main pipe work from the external unit, all the way up from here to the cylinder on the first floor. And I'm doing it on this MLCP pipe work right here. I'm gonna swap it to copper later on to connect it to the heat pump. That pipe work, it's 32 millimeters uh, insulated pipe work or pre-insulated pipe work goes from that location under the floor here across on the other side of the wall from the outside under the floor to the first floor sitting void there isn't a single fitting on flow and return primary pipe work and on new pre-insulated MLCP main supply as well so that pipe work goes upstairs right here there used to be a cylinder cupboard here you go. Behind that cylinder, I've got flow and return from the heat pump, flow and return going back to the kitchen for the underfloor heating manifold, flow and return for the radiators, uh, temperature and pressure relief. We're really lucky because there's an existing hot water pipe that we can connect to just to the top of the cylinder, so that's easy. And all of that pipe work has been run inside the joinery in a bedroom right here so we switch to copper inside inside that cupboard in the kitchen we'll have a new manifold this manifold as you can see doesn't have any actuators doesn't have any pump groups doesn't have any blending valves because we don't need it we will run this whole system at the same temperature as radiators 45 degrees c because we've designed this system to give correct output in every room on every floor. This used to be an airing cupboard, that's so I reconnected to the existing hot water pipe. They, uh, someone took the cylinder out, they put a combi boiler, and now we put the cupboard to its original use. It's back, an airing cupboard. I think actually in here there used to be a warm air unit. And as you can see, heat pump installation inside takes exactly the same space as the airing cupboard used to take when it had a warmer unit and a cylinder. So it doesn't always need tons of space. It's just a regular size airing cupboard. We made it slightly bigger here because uh, there was some old air ducts that we took out. That's why we don't have a wall on this side. But apart from that, you don't need tons of space. And for those who have been watching my videos about heat pumps, you probably know that I almost never install buffers or volumizers simply because we don't zone systems so we don't need more volume and we design the systems the way that they can run from the circulator in the external unit or just single circulator if the external unit doesn't have a built-in circulator because that way we get way more better efficiencies on our systems so full weather compensation no zoning whatsoever no buffers Anything up to 8 kilowatts is easily doable without buffers, unless you've got microbore or plastic pipe work, that might be slightly more difficult. Anything 10, 12 kilowatts becomes slightly more complex. However, we do have installations running without any buffers uh, of the size of around 10 kilowatts. And downstairs we have a floor ready for laying the pipe work. So this system looks super great quality. However, this is the little niggle number one with it. 
This is the most labor-intensive underfloor heating system you'll ever come across. Almost three days to do 50 square meters of floor area with this system just to prepare it for laying the pipe work. So laying the panels, cutting them to size, routing uh, blank panels, that took almost three days. To give you an idea, a screeded system would take us about half a day to install because it's just laying the pipe work on the insulation. Overlay system would take us maybe a day, day and a half to install on this area. This system takes twice as long as other comparable systems. So super labor intensive. Niggle number two, supply cost. Supply cost is about four times to what we pay for screeded systems and maybe three times to what we pay for other overlay systems. So when you take the system supply cost into the account, when you take how intense the labor is, this is by far the most expensive systems I've ever seen. However, I've never seen any other system that claims to have such a large output especially on TOG1 or timber floors, uh, so high resistive uh, floor finishes. And in this case, there's just no other system, unless they went for a screeded floor, which would be kind of tricky on timber floors. Not impossible, just kind of tricky. So now, another thing that's interesting is that we've got the same spacing and the same system in the kitchen and in the living room. However, we're using different floor finishes. So the living room will get timber floor finish, TOG value of one, so it needs higher flow temperature than the kitchen that will get tiles. Obviously, we can't tile straight on this system. That wouldn't work. So there is a dry screech system that goes on top of the system in the kitchen. If we were to run this underfloor heating at the same temperature, which we have to do, of mean water temperature of 43 deg degrees Celsius, we would get 100 watts per square meter in the kitchen and 70 watts here in the lounge. Now, I'm not sure how much you could balance it out with flow rates and how much this naturally would have balanced itself out. Uh, it's a 30% difference. It might be a difference that's a bit too large. So we could put a temperature limiter in the kitchen and shut the zone off when it reaches the temperature, but we've done something else. We're gonna run it at a lower flow, te flow temperature or lower mean water temperature than 43 uh, degrees Celsius. And we just retained one radiator in the living room and that allows us to compensate for a higher uh, resistance on the floor finishes here. And that way we should be able to run the whole system at the same flow temperature and balance out any imperfections by controlling the flow on the manifold, on the flow meters. What makes this system so labor intensive is the fact that the spaces between the joists are never identical. So you have to cut every single panel to size and quite often you have to cut them from both sides because if the panel cut only on one side has the groove touching the joist or actually maybe the groove doesn't even fit so you can't get three grooves, you have to cut it on both sides. Some of them, usually you can cut it on one side but some of them were cut on both sides. Then obviously you've got those panels with a quite a thick aluminium plate and uh, you cut it with a circular so you put them upside down so we don't uh, shred the aluminium which we've learned quite quickly and then you've got return panels so this is uh, one third of a panel that you also have cut to cut to size and once you've done all those panels then you also have blank panels they just look you know like this this is the back of the return but the blanks they look like you know just a blank panel with no grooves and then you have to route them to suit your pipework layout. You also have to route across the joist, so you have to route the timber. All of that is super labor intensive. This installation takes much longer than overlay panels and way longer than screeded systems. So if you've got a project where you don't want to be raising a floor at all, when you want to have super efficient system and you need to have 70 watts output per square meter 
and you want timber floor finish or carpets, this product is the only product that I've come across, thanks to the client who found that company, that claims to be able to supply that. And if those claims are true, then this would resolve a lot of difficult projects. It would make it possible to install floor finishes in period properties or poorly insulated properties without raising the floor. Labor intensive comes at the cost, but does what no other product on the market that I have seen can do. So now we have everything connected, system filled with water, cylinder filled with water, no leaks, so you can see the pressure there on the gauge. So now we have compressor active, the unit's running on, on hot water. Let's have a look outside. And the unit is running on hot water now. So finally it's all running, so it's Murray's favorite job now. Lagging. Lagging. <laughs>